hello, everybody. My name is Fred Medlicott. I'm one of the uh, cooperative developers at the Northwest Cooperative Development Center. We're the ones that have organized this webinar today. Um, and the Northwest Cooperative Development Center, I think probably most of you already know this, but it's always good to say it again. We're a nonprofit 501c3 organization devoted to assisting new and existing cooperative businesses in the Pacific Northwest, everything from daycare centers to credit unions to farm workers cooperatives. Um, if it's a co-op, we'll, we'll work to support you. Um, we primarily work in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, but historically we've also supported projects in Alaska and Hawaii. Um, and we are organizing this today to discuss how the cooperative sector can help um, build and rebuild regional economies and support regional economic development and also what you can do to help support co-op development in your area. Um, we're also asking folks, we're participating in, in the Give Big Washington fundraising drive. Um, so we're also doing this in part to, to you know, ask folks to donate to us. Um, if you're interested in doing that, you can go to givebigwa.org slash NWCDC. Um, so the agenda for tonight, um, after this intro, John, my colleague, John McNamara, is going to give a basic overview of what cooperatives are. Um, then we'll talk about why co-ops are good for local economies and talk about uh, some of the work that co-ops have been doing here in Washington um, and then around the country to build a solidarity economy. Um, and then we're going to kick it to some of our guests. We've got guests from around the country and in state involved in uh, different, different cooperative work in all sorts of sectors. They'll be talking about what's going on uh, nationally and locally. And then we'll highlight some success stories here in Washington and hand it over to John McNamara, my colleague, and he's going to give us a brief overview of the cooperative model. Thanks, John. Thank you, Fred, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining today. And I guess first I want to say, uh, you know, what something I've been saying a lot lately is that there's, uh, there's really never been a better time to start a cooperative. Today, the cooperative uh, movement in groups is, is robust. Uh, the number, the amount of organizations like NWCDC are uh, all over the country now. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, there were just a handful of centers like NWCDC, and even then, our center didn't really do much in the way of development. But today there's over, I think, 35 different co-op development centers. There's a number of other economic development centers that pursue the co-op model. And the 2018 Main Street Employee Ownership Act gave a specific mandate to the small business uh, development centers across the country to provide support to co-op, um, worker co-op specifically conversions. And so it's definitely, um, it's definitely a time. And so, um, I'm assuming most people are relatively familiar with co-ops. I'm not going to, you know, we didn't want to do PowerPoints. We wanted it to be more of a conversation. So rather than talk about the formal definitions, um, co-ops generally are about mutual aid and, uh, and I think really about local communities, however you define your community, working together to uh, meet uh, the needs and, and find solutions to the community's problems, whether that's housing or employment, or access to, uh, to goods and services, or even finding a market for um, for your goods and services. And what co-ops do is they operate on a net cost basis, so that uh, the focus is really on meeting that need. They uh, subordinate capital to the individual, and so that's the other part of it, is that at the heart of the co-op focus is not generating profit for the sake of generating profit. It's Focusing on those those needs of the of the membership, or and usually that's the human needs of the members. And so, kind of with that, uh, and, and then within that, there are a lengthy list of, of values and principles. But uh, today, we're going to probably have most of our speakers are going to be talking a lot about worker co-ops, but there'll also be some food systems and some housing discussion going on. But ultimately, uh, there are economic organizations that are are operated democratically to, to meet those needs. And so, um, in terms of local economic development, one of the things that, <clears throat> that we see a lot is uh, people wanting to find, especially today, wanting to find a new way of doing business. That the traditional models of of generating um, 
economic activity in a community tend to be attracting large employers to come into town with a lot of tax benefits and, and other, and, you know, um, giving easements on environmental standards and et cetera. Um, and usually when those uh, tax benefits or those easements change for whenever it's more economically opportune, those same businesses will go away. So it's a really it's sort of a temporary fix to chase, uh, be chasing corporations to bring in jobs. And we think right now there's a really vibrant opportunity to just build those local jobs with local businesses, especially um, you know, given the, the point that we're in, where we're rebuilding out of this pandemic, but even before the pandemic, um, the uh, baby boom generation's uh, uh, movement towards retirement has already created this pressure of existing small businesses looking for, for people to buy them. And I think Project Equity, which um, has done some great work at really identifying that only about 20% of existing businesses expected to go on to a new generation of ownership and in rural communities, but even in urban communities, these can mean uh, that longstanding businesses in that defined neighborhoods and defined towns may simply just disappear unless they can find a buyer. And very often that buyer might be, and might the only buyer might be the, the employees. And so keeping those jobs, but also keeping that cultural identity alive is something that I think is really vital. And then too, of course, as I mentioned, Oh, so, sorry, John, I muted you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, cooperatives, uh, also one of the benefits of them is that they tend not to move. They, they structurally cannot go and chase the best tax break in the country because the members would actually have to move as well. And so, uh, and so this really gives us an opportunity to, uh, to build long-lasting and resilient organizations uh, for our local communities. And, and today, as we're rebuilding, we're seeing... Um, a tenfold increase in requests for service at our center, and we're seeing this around the country. Um, where we used to get three or four requests a month, we're getting three to four a week now. We're hearing this is happening uh, throughout the United States. So we know that this is a real moment and people are looking at uh, a different way of doing business. Um, locally, uh, there are some other networks that are formed. I know that, I think Deborah's here, there's the Cascades Cooperatives that did an event last October uh, with, that also had Rebecca Campbell speaking, and uh, the Olympic Co-op Network. I don't know if the representatives from either one that would like to just talk briefly about what their their networks are doing, but it's part of also building this infrastructure in the uh, in the community. So, Deborah, did you are you willing to chat a little bit about the Olympic Co-op Network? Maybe not. Or maybe not. <laughs> in that case, we can come back to it. And lo locally here in Thurston County, we're also working to create uh, co-sound. And um, part of that will be uh, including using an AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer. Maybe, Fred, if you want to talk about that, and I can find the link to the VISTA application. Yeah, um, co-sound, the idea behind co-sound is, um, you know, similar to the Olympic and the Peninsula, you know, the Olympic Peninsula and the Cascade Network up in the north. Um, is to create a regional co-op network for all sectors. I think the the long-term vision for CoSound is is to eventually establish it as the uh, sort of the statewide uh, tier three co-op of co-op of co-ops. Um, so so be the the network that'll coordinate all the other network activity. Um, and yeah, we're in the process of getting that incorporated and started up. The the business planning. Um, finished up sort of right before COVID hit and then everything got on uh, put on ice for a year, but we're hoping to uh, have that organization formally formed and be starting the membership drive um, here this year so we'll people stay tuned. Um, but yeah, the goal is we'll incorporate as a 501c4 and, and hope to be uh, able to coordinate activity between the networks and also um, start doing some statewide advocacy as well. So that'll that's exciting. If, if people are interested, please reach out to us uh, if you want to get your co-op involved in that statewide network. And so one of the things we also want to talk about is uh, this fall, of course, our local elections, and there are uh, you know candidates throughout the uh, throughout our community in Washington running for uh, both city council, uh, port commissions, and county commissions, all of which 
are engaging in uh, some level of cooperative economic development. And so part of today and most of the meat of the conversation is to talk about what else is happening in, in the country. Like I said, there is really a cooperative moment right now. So I think we want to start with um, uh, Zen from the Democracy at Work Institute. I'll let, let Zen introduce himself and then we'll kind of find out and listen to what other, what other parts of the world or our country are doing. Excellent. Good way, Zen. Thank you so much, John. And again, thank you to the Northwest Co-op Development Center uh, for inviting me to, to share a little bit about what's happening around the country. I, I just want to say, like, yes, what we're seeing right now in our region uh, is exactly what we're seeing around the country. Like, the time is now to, um, for us to really invest in uh, cooperative strategies to meet people's needs um, and to think differently about the economy we want to build towards, not the economy that we've inherited and are now dealing with. It's like, what are we actually trying to address here at the root cause? And are we going back to status quo or are we trying to do something different? So it's about meeting needs now, it's about meeting needs of tomorrow and in doing it better. And I think um, cooperatives, while no panacea, um, are certainly uh, one of the tools in the toolkit uh, to help us do that. So um, I'm based in Portland, Oregon. Um, I was, you know, lived in California for the longest time, but I'm now actually in this area. So excited to be talking about some of this work, given that I'm now in Oregon. But um, a little bit about Democracy Work Institute, a little bit about who the heck I am and just a little context. I'm gonna give you a sense of what's, what's the landscape look like in terms of support. So I'm, um, I'm Zen Trenum, I'm the program and policy manager for the Democracy at Work Institute. Uh, we were founded by the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives to expand the field of worker co-op development uh, to reach communities of color, uh, low-wage workforces, and recent immigrants. And I, in particular, uh, manage our Shared Equity and Economic Development Fellowship Program, or SEED program for short, um, I, where we support cities to develop employee ownership initiatives that meet the needs of their communities. So I do a little bit of policy work, I do a little bit of city practice work, and I'm, I'm here today to talk about all the different ways cities are uh, putting the support into practice. So. You know, uh, what I'm going to be talking about, uh, as John <laughs> referred to, is like very much work at co-op specific. So I know there are other forms and there are other forms we should be thinking about if we're trying to talk about community wealth building and uh, equitable recovery. But, you know, sitting in our organization, doing the work we do, right, we, we focus on worker ownership, right? We know it's a proven tool for creating and maintaining sustainable, dignified jobs, generating wealth, improving the quality of workers particularly for those who lack access um, to, the, to sustainable you know, work options. Um, that includes, right, first time entrepreneurs, recent immigrants, returning citizens. Um, there are over 460 worker co-ops in the country with over 7,000 workers. And the majority of those um, are people are, who work at worker co-ops are, are people of color um, and identify as female. And increasingly the form is being used by contractors, contingent workers, uh, retiring owners choosing to sell the business to their employees. And so generally, the, so, you know, many different communities in the country are increasingly looking towards worker ownership to meet needs that are not being met right now. And so cities themselves are also utilizing their form to address economic and community concerns. Um, and you know, as mentioned earlier, right, the, the deep inequities in our economy that COVID-19 really laid bare is not gonna miraculously disappear. Um, and so while new federal support is obviously trying to target inequities, cities are facing a pretty long path towards rebuilding a more equitable and resilient economies. And so the challenge is how do we ensure better jobs and stronger workplaces? Ensure that recovery is shared more broadly by amongst us all and that um, our communities have a stronger base to weather future downturns. And so many cities, I, I, my last count, there are over two dozen cities around the country who are now have active employee ownership initiatives. And that's not even counting the ones that are exploring this option right now. Um, they're all you know, uh, making employee ownership um, a less burdensome route for entrepreneurs and selling owners uh, by doing what they already do to support small business in many cases, increasing access to information and resources on the form, integrating worker ownership support into existing programs and services, providing technical assistance, uh, increasing access to existing you know, small business lending programs. And so in places like Boston and San Francisco, there are new efforts to develop worker co-ops for people with barriers to work by helping them access work through owning their own business. In places like Cleveland, they're using employee ownership to tackle the widening racial wealth gap by providing a means for workers to build assets through ownership. And then where we're seeing the, some of the strongest growth and interest in employee ownership is this question about how do we preserve our longstanding small businesses from 
uh, closing entirely just for lack of a buyer. Um, and so in places like Durham, Miami, Santa Clara, uh, cities are helping save businesses um, by helping the employees buy the business from, from their owners. And so, you know, just a, a few specific examples of initiatives that cities have taken. Um, City of Berkeley, for uh, example, about a year or so ago, approved about 100K uh, for legacy business transitions by providing succession planning services and technical assistance to transition to work ownership. They allocated funding for market research, to collect data on legacy businesses, and then um, uh, contracted with an organization to conduct business outreach and technical assistance. Uh, they also made changes to a revolving loan fund to make it easier for worker owned business to access small business lending programs, uh, where the only barrier was the limit on how many owners could apply for a loan. So that was five, and most many worker cooperatives uh, have more than five worker owners. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they changed all that. City of New York, um, they're one of the key examples around the country of ecosystem building strategies. The city over the past six, six years has invested 15 million um, in discretionary funds to incubate, create, or convert worker-owned businesses. Uh, that has generated over 631 uh, jobs and 132 worker co-op businesses as of 2020, oh, reached over 8,000 entrepreneurs. And most recently, last December, uh, the city launched its Owner to Owners Initiative, which is a kind of a call center uh, designed for, uh, like commu communication campaign designed for business owners who are saying, look, I want to sell my business. What do I do? Basically call the call center and get access to referrals. Um, so those are a couple of ways that the city is continuing to invest in the ecosystem. And finally, in the city of Durham, um, uh, they're working to, uh, Durham, North Carolina, they're working to preserve their minority owned legacy businesses and expand small business ownership through transitions to, to worker co-ops. Um, and, you know, we, to talk a little bit about the program I run, the Shared Equity and Economic Development Fellowship, we, um, you know, we, we launched it you know, a few years ago with the National League of Cities to basically equip cities to make employer ownership a reality, how to figure out how they can incorporate in their toolkits. We selected Durham as one of our inaugural cities to work with uh, because there was no employee ownership ecosystem in the area. There's maybe one employee owned business. There was a lot of activity in Western North Carolina, certainly, no doubt about it. Uh, but in the city itself, employer was just not a, a widely understood concept. Uh, and so the city and its service provider ecosystem was, was quite skeptical, but they understood what we were trying to do here, right? They understood that employer was a vehicle uh, to helping achieve the city's priorities, which is about growing shared prosperity for all and in making sure they don't lose their longstanding black businesses. that have been around for some of them, been around for over a hundred years. The city is one of the original black Wall Streets in America. And so they took really small steps to really introduce and socialize the concept of employee ownership, both internal to the city and with its agencies, uh, with capital providers and small business technical assistance um, support ecosystem. They provided seed funding to development of centers like the Northwest Co-op Development Center uh, to basically provide uh, technical assistance um, support uh, to business owners who want to explore their succession plans to begin with, let alone uh, employee ownership. Um, and they conducted their first ever small business market research study. Um, most cities don't have legacy business databases. They don't know who, how old their small businesses are and they, until they find out that they've closed. And so they, they invested in that and were able to identify owners that they can reach uh, before they, go, they close. Uh, and we lose those jobs um, and we lose those services and um, that, uh, that critical community asset. So you know, I'll wrap up there to say the landscape support is growing. The time is now to figure out what are the viable solutions that can not only help us recover, but also rebuild uh, with a better economy. And there are so many cities that are doing this work. There's so many city champions who want to talk to other city champions to help figure out how this work can be done. And there are organizations like NWCDC that are helping steer this conversation, you know, connect the right dots and make sure that these conversations are happening at these, these, these demonstration projects can take off. So um, I'm really excited to be part of the conversation today and to continue being an ally really of the Northwest CDC and figuring out how we can continue to build on that, that this growing foundation support. Um, and I'll pass it back to John to carry on the conversation. Oh, and it looks like you're on mute, John. Sorry. Um, thank you so much, Dan. And um, 
Yeah, and I uh, forgot to mention earlier today, during the National Cooperative Business Association's annual meeting, they shared a policy paper that they put out last fall. Oh, Give me it again. Yeah. Hello? Can you, am I hearing? Yeah, we're back. Now. Thanks. For some reason, I muted myself. I don't know how I did that. Anyways, uh, the National Co-op Business Association has a policy paper out that uh, makes recommendations that can be even enacted at the state and local area. A good link in the chat. But uh, there's a lot of thinking about how to make the uh, environment a lot better. As I mentioned, uh, the 2018 Main Street Employee Ownership Act was really important because prior to that, small business development centers really uh, didn't see co-ops as part of their um, as part of their mission. And in many ways, uh, even uh, local economic development groups don't always see co-ops as being businesses. They see them as being something very different and, and more aligned with the not-for-profit community, which isn't the case. But, um, but now I want to jump over to uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Rebecca Kemble, and I'll let Rebecca introduce herself. But uh, you know, Madison was one of the initial cities to really start working with uh, supporting cooperative development as a plan. So Rebecca, thank you for joining us. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rebecca Kimball. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm just uh, literally like an hour and a half back home from a 4,000 mile road trip. So if I, if I seem a little <laughs> spacey, that's why. Um, also, we have 15 baby chicks on the table nearby, so you might hear some ambient noise. Um, I'm a 21 year worker co-op member, uh, worker owner at Union Cab of Madison, uh, which is where I, I met John. Um, and uh, so I'm coming to this topic from a practitioner, a very practical point of view. Um, I have, I'm the past president of the US Federation for Worker Co-ops and have held positions in uh, SICOPA, the International Worker Cooperative Organization, um, and just finished six years um, serving as an alder on the Madison Common Council. So I, um, I ran for common council when our then mayor was talking about, had heard that New York City was going to invest money in, in worker co-op development. And he said, oh, I'm not gonna be bested you know, by New York. I'm gonna invest more, you know, way more per capita than they do. And um, so when I heard him say that, I thought, you know, I could sit back and complain about how he's doing it wrong, or I could try to you know, get elected and, and have a seat at the table. Uh, so that's what I did. And um, so we, um, I don't know, John, if you want me to talk mostly about the city stuff or about the uh, mad work or anything, city. Sorry, you're on mute. I think both, whatever, whatever you feel is, is important and that people should know. Okay, okay. well, I'm just so passionate about worker cooperatives uh, because of really my, my own experience in being transformed as a person um, in, in them. So I, I came to Union Cab and got a job as a driver as uh, just sort of a, a, a couple month gig to tide me over until I started a job at University of Wisconsin Madison. And you know, within a couple of weeks, what I learned about the worker cooperative was that 180 people of all kinds of backgrounds and all varying levels of education could be trusted to make really big dis decisions about a $6 million business together. Um, and that I, as a new member was being asked to participate in that would just blew my mind. Like, I'm just new around here. What, what do I have to, you know, what do I have to say about, do we get rid of the transit and bus divisions and radically restructure our whole business? Um, and so that was like, that was a real wake up call to me going through that process. And John will tell you about, you know, how not pretty those, those big decisions are, but how ultimately sustainable they are in a business when we stick to our cooperative uh, principles and uh, involve everybody uh, in, in the business decisions. And when we have a shared, you know, when John and I worked in the early 2000s on strategic planning and getting, um, getting really aligned with the, with the needs of our members and setting out you know, our business um, objectives and our values um, to, to be in sync with that. 
And, and when you do that really in-depth work with a diverse group of people in uh, an industry as, as taxi industry is that is so vital to community service. Um, uh, it's, you know, we build something more than just a business. It's a real um, community asset that, that um, belongs not only to the worker owners, but, but the whole community. Um, so it's, you know, for me, uh, and a big part of Union Cab success has been being in networks with other worker co-ops in Madison for mutual aid. So I'm going to talk about uh, co-op networks in terms of not in, and worker co-ops, not just in terms of discrete businesses that are, you know, a cool different way of organizing, but that can actually provide um, provide sustainable livelihoods for a wide variety of people, even within an intensely like capitalist um, competitive context that, that can center humane values, that can center needs of people. Um, and so one worker co-op business is cool, but when we're networked together and we actually engage in trade networks and supply chains, um, we can really create uh, a non a non exploitive economic reality for people, um, and that means something to people's lives, to people's day to day lives. Um, and so, in all of my work in, at, at you know the federation at, at Sacopa and locally, has been about um, has been about building those relationships, which again, co ops are basically built on relationships. And if you have you know, I don't care how great your, your um, business plan is and how much capital you have. If you're starting a co-op and your relationships aren't right with the members, that's gonna, that's gonna go off the rails pretty soon. Um, so, sorry, I'm just kind of pontificating about my personal, <laughs> personal theory of worker co-ops, but um, this is what brought me to the city level to, to say, hey, we have enough co-op worker cooperatives. Um, and again, not just uh, employee owned businesses, but worker cooperatives that, that, uh, that are democratically owned, one, one worker, one vote, and democratically managed, um, that we can actually start to build a solidarity economy in, in our city, especially if we have um, city support. And so, when I became an alder and got on the, the, the common council, I was not just advocating for, yes, let's support this $3 million worker co-op uh, project, but also let's really think about our economic development strategies differently. So, you know, like John said, we're not just smokestacks chasing and trying to, um, you know, increase the property tax base, but we're investing in the people. Because the, 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 the foundation of a, of a healthy economy is, well, even deeper than the people is land, is healthy land and water, but then is people who are healthy and engaging in, in productive work that um, doesn't, that isn't exploitative. And that, you know, that, that, that um, doesn't externalize all the costs, you know, the human costs or the environmental costs. And so I really tried to start uh, shifting our economic development um, practice in Madison to help people understand that um, that people and their and their productive capacity and their willingness to uh, and their interest in um, in working together to create goods and services um, that that could that can be just as legit as you know giving tax incremental financing to a development project probably more legit because it's a lot more sustainable and you're building safety nets, you're building these mutual aid networks of people with relationships that go beyond just their economic transactional value. Um, so that has been the vision that I've always worked from is, is that worker co-ops are really an organizational tool for the transformation of individual people and, and um, of communities through the individual's lived experience in having to deal with what you have to deal with in collective decision-making processes and uh, discernment processes and all of that. So what we learned in the city, the city uh, project was that, um, you know, 
capital actually wasn't a problem. So part of the money went for a high risk capital startup fund. So that wasn't really a problem. Technical assistance wasn't really a problem um, because we in our community were blessed with a lot of uh, capacity, uh, intellectual and, and experienced people in cooperatives. But what, what was really missing was, um, was the, the peer to peer networking and the peer to peer counseling and the peer to peer relationships with new worker owners to start up um, new co-ops. And so, although we do have, you know, we have this revolving loan fund and we have resources funding for, to pay for technical assistance, um, even when some of the new startup co-ops got that, what they really needed was um, other worker owners to really just kind of share about their personal experience with you know, writing their bylaws and, um, you know, you can come with some technical expertise about that, but, but when it, when um, the sort of the, when the help and assistance comes from um, peers who have been, who have had lived experience doing these things, um, doing the business things and doing and building out the cooperative networks, that is so, so, so valuable. So Mad Work, the Madison Area Worker Cooperatives is really building, really trying to build that peer support network because um, you know, we don't just wanna like write grant reports that say X number of co-ops were made and, and then two, three years later they fall apart or they're feeling, you know, after the developers leave, there's, you know, they're just like a discrete business somewhere. We really wanna build up these networks to actually transform our community in, in a way that's much bigger than just a single business. So um, I guess that's what I have to say this evening. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, that, that was great. I think the Madison story is always a really exciting one. And, uh, and please stick around for, for questions if you can. Um, so let's jump over to Santa Clara and Kurt Vartan. Hi folks. Uh, yes, my name is Kirk Vartan, uh, originally from New York City, and I moved out to uh, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, uh, back in 98. And uh, to work at high tech, like everybody does that comes to Silicon Valley, I worked at Cisco for almost eight and a half years, almost nine years. And uh, I never got my fill of pizza that I grew up with. So I ended up starting a pizza place. I'm like, how hard can it be, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> inside joke to myself. So we opened up in 2006, uh, always with the intent of having employee ownership as part of the culture um, and employee empowerment. And unfortunately, when we opened up in 2006, uh, the legal team that we engaged with had never dealt with any kind of um, worker cooperative or employee ownership structure other than like out here, you had stock options. And in our case, in, in Cisco's case, you know, or any any high tech, you get, you know, this much options, you own this much of the company, but hey, you know what, you're an owner and you feel that pride of ownership in your company. We always wanted to bring that to our business. Um, and we, we always know that it's, it's all about the people. Your people make your business, no matter how good your product is, if you don't have people, you don't have anything. And that was always something I was drilled in when I was in New York at NBC and at Cisco. Uh, uh, it was always drilled in as a corporate culture. And so we emb embodied that in our business as well. And so we always had a very, we did annual reviews and things like that. And so I, I, the reason I bring all that up is, um, well, I'll give you a little bit more background. So we opened up our second location in 2011. So we have two locations here, one in Sunnyvale and the original one in Santa Clara. And we became a worker cooperative in 2017. In July of 2017, we became the first brick and mortar worker cooperative in the South Bay and here in, in the, you know, the traditional Silicon Valley in Santa Clara County. And we're hoping to change that. We did this for a number of reasons. One, we believe in the model. Um, and because when we started telling our teams, like, look, we need to, um, you want to own this business, you want to be an employee ownership, you know, get engaged and figure out how to do it. Because I'll tell you right now, I don't have the cycles to do it. I don't have the capacity to figure it out. You figure it out. Let's talk about it. And then we'll talk about how to make it happen because that's what we want to do. And so we had a biz dev team that came together and started researching. And we found worker cooperatives matched and kind of aligned with our culture of empowerment and um, access to 
you know, knowledge of, of individuals and respect, uh, mutual respect. And so we took that path with Project Equity, a project who was just starting bringing businesses from private ownership to uh, worker cooperatives. The work cooperative landscape looked a lot more feasible for us than the ESOP model, which seemed really complicated and expensive and a lot of overhead. So we did not take that path. Uh, we started with uh, 13 uh, original founding owners, worker cooperative owners, my wife and I being two of those um, 13. Uh, since then, we've lost three and gained um, three. So we're, we're still at 13. At one point we had 16 and, and through an, a couple of reasons, uh, things have changed. Um, but what, a couple of things I, I, I would just, so that's just a, a little bit of background. And I, I have some slides, which I'm not gonna share, but I can share with John or anybody that wants to know some of the challenges we have, what our membership agreement is, you know, kind of the, the, what we set expectations with people, like, you know, this is a commitment. We don't want you on this co-op as an owner if you don't have a time horizon that matches what is realistic. If you think it's gonna be a six month, get your money and bail, you're not gonna be a good fit. Uh, so we, we, we make our uh, owners sign a membership agreement that has a two year time horizon commitment that we expect you to be here for a minimum of two years. And that your deposit, we have a $3,000 buy-in, uh, the deposit of $750, if you choose not to stay that full two years, stays in the business. So it's not the end of the world, the 750 break anybody, no, but it'll sting and we want it to sting. We want you to feel that you got some um, you know, buy-in into this, into this company and you're taking it seriously. If you don't take it seriously, if you get another offer, there's no contract, you can walk away at any time. It's all voluntary. No one, ha we have a hybrid of worker owners and non-worker owners that work side by side. There's no, no issue there. So we provide that out, but with a, a little bit of, you didn't meet your commitment to the business. So you are now um, losing that, that deposit. All the rest of it comes back to you and every all the other patronage that's earned comes back to you. That has nothing to do with that. It just has to do with that deposit to, to take it a little bit more seriously. So that is kind of our, our background. One of the biggest, and I'm, I'm involved with, with Zen and, and, and others in, a, in an organization focused at the state level because I believe very passionately about this model. Um, I didn't do this as a succession plan. I didn't do this as a way to bail out of the business. I did this as a way to uh, really test the theory of employee ownership and the value of that personally. I think my wife and I really believe in that personally. And this is a way to really put your money where your mouth is kind of thing and demonstrate that. So that's what we've been doing. We were coming up on four years now that we've been a co-op. Um, we have five committees that we started. We started with our finance and employee benefits committee and created our first PTO uh, plan, sick time, dental, uh, and other healthcare type. We have a massage um, and chiropractic services available to our team, uh, made those available and look at PTO hours when they accrue, how quickly they accrue, like those are all, we never had that as, as, a, as a business before. Um, we have our um, culture and accountability team because we believe our culture is thing that is our special sauce that makes us special. And we wanna protect that and hold each other accountable to making sure that culture stays intact. We have an innovation committee, which looks at innovating not just products, but processes and trying to tighten up how we do things. Uh, we created, just recently created a health and safety committee focused on employee safety, which has been a priority over this last year and a half, as well as uh, health and sanitation priorities, which has always been our top priority, um, employee safety and health and sanitation. So we have a health and safety committee. And just recently at our last general meeting, which was uh, two weeks ago, we created a um, merch committee, the merch merchandising and marketing committee. That's the fun committee that we used to have seen all the people that joined that. We have like nine people on that committee. And I, I was very clear, I was like, that's great, but you don't get to make that your one committee. That's your second committee. That's the dessert. You go do the governance stuff that makes the company work, and then you can play in the marketing committee and the merchandising committee once we take care of business. Uh, so everybody's required as a member to be on at least one committee. We, we set the expectations about four to six hours a month. Reality is it's not, but we set that expectation and make it very clear in our membership agreement, that's what you're committing to. And so we haven't been, up, been enforcing that, especially during COVID. Um, but now that we're coming out of this, we're really kind of retrenching. And you know, God bless the uh, members of our, of our board. They were getting frustrated with people not participating. They're like, I, we're sick of people not doing, pulling their, their share. And I'm like, you know what? Good. You should be pissed. I've been pissed for three years. And I don't see anybody else being pissed. But I'm not going to, you know, it's not my job as a general manager to voice that. This is a member issue. 
If the members don't want to hold each other accountable, that's on the membership. I can express myself, but I'm not, I'm not the general manager trying to enforce participation. And so as a board, we met and uh, we decided that if members don't want to participate and meet their commitment, the board has actually the authority to terminate membership. And we were very clear. I messaged that matrix. Everybody knew about that. And when we held a member only meeting, um, we got everybody to kind of re-up their membership and agree to be a part of it or walk away. And it's fine. You don't have to be here. And we want to make, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to be here, you got to work. And so we had that kind of come to Jesus meeting and it could have gone one way or another, who knows, but it didn't. It worked out very positively and we're on a track and we have more, you know, internal governance capacity than we've ever had. Like we're at like, you know, three times our capacity than we've been working on for the last three years. So it's very exciting, or I say two years. So it's very exciting that uh, that this is starting. People are being productive. They get it. They're engaged. And um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any whatever questions you have. Anything's fair game. So thanks, John. Yeah. Before before you we jump off, I just I want to also point out like so you were the first co-op in the community, and now there's actual city development work going for co-ops, right? Because Dan right. kind of saw your success. And if you could just maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk briefly about that. Yeah, you're absolutely. You're, of course, I should have uh, tied that in because it's a city-focused uh, activities. Um, Santa Clara in 2019, we presented to their marketing committee and, and, and said, look, you know, this is a, a model we were hoping that you will support going forward. And the city council liked it so much that we did a, a formal presentation in July to the entire city staff and council and council chambers, full council chambers. It was great. A lot of attendance. And uh, we had all the all the expert players in the area that participated in that message. And it was really to inform city council about what worker ownership, what worker cooperatives were and why they should care. And that to me is the biggest hole in all of government right now is that lack of awareness and understanding. Because there's plenty, we're an LLC. We're nothing, there's nothing magic about our, our finance structure or anything else. So trying to make it simple for people to just kind of understand the base concepts to, and to kind of, it's like, is this really like a fairy tale? It's like, is, is you, what are you talking? It sounds like you're, you know, a bunch of hippies smoking weed in the corner doing stuff. And it's like, no, 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 this is mainstream. It's not, not niche, it's mainstream. This, the government backed SBA and, and to really send that message. It's like, get the red herring conversations out of the way. This is real. Let's focus on the content, not on the theory of, is this real or not? And so they were so excited about this. They actually funded um, a program called the Worker Cooperative Initiative and even before they passed a resolution, they passed a resolution the following year in 2020, but in 2019, in less than seven months, they went from hearing it for the first time to funding it at a hundred thousand dollar level um, to, and engaging uh, the necessary experts like Dawes, one of the experts, Selk, uh, the Federation and Project Equity are all four of the key experts that came together right at the beginning, rather than being pulled in one at a time as cities need them to do services when they have the understanding. It's like Santa Clara knows they don't have any capacity. They don't have any idea what they were, they're doing in this space. They don't even have an economic development department because you know companies fall out of the sky and just park themselves in Santa Clara, you know, big tech, right? So that this is like the first kind of seed in the economic development toolbox or the tool in their toolbox for this. And so they understand they need to get capacity up. They need to understand what processes exist. How do you mature those? How do you scale it? How do you reach the business clients? How do you reach the community and, make, and, and create awareness? And so I'm also working with Mission College um, as, as are others uh, to help raise awareness. Mission College is in the city of Santa Clara, one of the older universities in the state. And uh, yeah, it's just very exciting. There's, there's a lot of awareness going on at the local level, at the state level with assembly and state activities, and even at the federal level with Congressman Rokana in the Silicon Valley. He's our Silicon Valley representative down here. And so there's, you know, the biggest message is there's alignment across all layers of government at the local level, right up through uh, the national level. And I think that's really important to know that I don't know how many things are, are, are aligned at that, at, to that degree. And I, and I think that's where we are right now. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so let's bring it back to Washington and Joel Williamson from the eastern part of the state. And uh, he has a couple of different projects he's working on that I think are, are really exciting and talking to this moment. So Joel, why don't you take it away? Perfect, thank you everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm Joel. Um, I live in Spokane, Washington, uh, eastern part of the state next to Idaho. 
And uh, over the last seven years, uh, co-founded two different cooperatives. Um, the first one is Link Foods, uh, which is a farmer and worker-owned cooperative uh, food hub and uh, Craft Malt House as well. So we work with small farms, small organic farms to bring all of their products together, find markets for those. Um, we also work with small grain farms to bring their unique grains together and malt those um, to be the base ingredient for breweries and distilleries and home brewers. Uh, and then coming out of all of that work and out of my personal interests as well, um, two and a half, almost three years ago, we co-founded uh, another cooperative, um, primarily worker owned, although we do have a couple uh, farmer owners as well. Um, it's, a, it's called The Grain Shed and it is a bakery and brewery. So kind of playing off of the food shed, water shed idea, it's, it's the grain shed. You can come to our place and really experience uh, everything unique about uh, Eastern Washington Palouse region grains, which has been really fun. Uh, really, really cool business. We've done uh, pretty well through COVID, which is uh, <laughs> good. It was scary, um, but uh, probably as Kirk has found, people still want pizza. They still want bread, um, beer. So yeah, we found a way to make it work. Um, tons of stuff I could talk about learning through those two co-ops, just uh, you know, developing those uh, from the ground up um, and with uh, NWCDC help, uh, also uh, DAWI help, Federation help uh, from the early days, trying to figure out how to do it. Not a lot of co-op support in our part of the world. So uh, uh, NWCDC over in Olympia. And then uh, we also work with um, Mission West uh, in uh, Western Montana. It's kind of the next closest uh, cooperative development center for us. So uh, also the first worker cooperatives in our city um, in Spokane and uh, <laughs> It's just, uh, yeah, I, I totally believe in the model. It's, it's a lot of fun and a, a big struggle to, uh, to make that work, to find accountants and lawyers that actually know what you're talking about. And, uh, and then to, you know, try to educate both your own uh, workers as you grow and uh, your customers so that they kind of understand the value of what you're providing. Um, the thing I kind of wanted to touch on that's new for us and really exciting, and we're doing this again in partnership with uh, Northwest Cooperative Development Center, um, having started these uh, two co-ops kind of from the ground up over the last six years and just uh, finding how, um, uh, how tiring that can be to really bootstrap each one of these businesses uh, from the ground up each time and trying to figure out, for me, I really, really believe in this model as well. I've uh, deeply, I've, I've seen it work, um, seen kind of the the struggle and the magic of it all and uh, want to spread worker ownership um, more broadly in our city. Uh, we certainly have no <laughs> city support. I'm very jealous of, uh, of these initiatives that are happening across the country and that's something we'll have to work on next. Um, so maybe coming out of that and me coming out of a realization that I want to continue to spread worker ownership without perhaps uh, starting each one of the next cooperatives for the next 30 or 40 years and maybe ending up uh, not married any longer uh, in doing so. <laughs> uh, trying to figure out like what's the best catalyst or mechanism by which to do that work. And so what we are now launching is a worker cooperative holding company. So we are raising capital. Uh, we've, we've formed as a, uh, as a worker cooperative. Uh, we're going to bring capital in from local investors that we know um, through some crowdfunded equity investments. And then we're going to purchase small businesses in the community um, that find themselves in exactly the situation that a lot of you have touched on. So folks that are looking to retire, uh, they want their business to live on, they want their people to be taken care of, they need to find a way to exit. Um, even just folks that are kind of like sole proprietors that are trying to, you know, they, they need to move on to something else. Um, it's, it, it is rare that those folks find a good buyer. And so uh, we're gonna kind of shift our, our model and basically purchase small businesses in our community to create an ecosystem of uh, small businesses that work together. Each one of the entities will be wholly owned by the holding company. And then the holding company will actually employ all of the people in the entire network and they will all be worker owners of the holding company. So it's kind of using the power of the worker uh, or the power of the traditional holding company model in kind of traditional capitalism and then inverting that so that all of the employees um, actually co-own and, and co-govern that entity. So super exciting. Um, 
definitely overwhelming, <laughs> lots of stuff to figure out still. Um, we have one model that we're kind of uh, in conversation with and learning from, which is Obron, if, if anyone's heard of them, O-B-R-A-N. Um, I think they're the only other kind of worker cooperative holding company uh, in existence so far, but then there's also the Main Street Phoenix project in Colorado that's doing a similar thing to us, but uh, focusing only on the food service industry. We're going to be a little more uh, agnostic about uh, industry and over time come to represent multiple industries in Spokane to, to really create that ecosystem like I was talking about. Um, we're starting out uh, in a way where we're trying to conceptualize the, the, the first acquisitions as really buying in a team that we care about, buying in expertise that we need for the entire uh, holding company. So for instance, um, we're buying a co-working space uh, LLC, some mobile offices, we're buying a um, graphic design, marketing, uh, kind of really cutting edge B Corp, um, you know, design and advertising firm, get all of that expertise on board. Um, we're going to buy some food service businesses, kind of all, all kinds of stuff over time. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there because there's probably a lot of questions around that, but that that's the next horizon for us. And uh, it feels like the project that I could work on um, for the rest of my life and, and hopefully make a pretty big impact here in, in our city and, and work on these citywide efforts, which absolutely need to happen. And uh, we're kind of in a co-op desert. So uh, looking forward to building that that system as well. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Uh, get my video started back up here. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you so much for talking about that project. That's super exciting. I wasn't even aware that you guys are that far along. Um, and I think it's worth calling out here, you know, that that most of the folks that are here today that are involved in doing the, uh, you know, advocating for, for their local co-op development and regional co-op development are themselves worker cooperators. Um, and I think that's a big testament to the way that the model tends to really empower workers and, and uh, kind of like Rebecca said that, you know, you, you start thinking you're going to drive cab and you end up on city council. So I think that's a, probably an under, um, under, I don't know what the word is. Uh, people don't talk about that enough, I guess, that the, the way that participation in these cooperative enterprises tends to uh, really build people's sort of skill and, and, and help them realize the, the power and the voice that they can have in their community. So it's really exciting to hear about all these projects. Um, we are gonna open the floor to questions, but we wanted to highlight a few more success stories here in Washington first. Um, and let's see, I was hoping that Nora, perfect. So we've got Nora Edge. She's the uh, general manager here in Olympia at Capital Home Care. That's a project that the North Cooperative Development Center was involved in. Um, and so I'm hoping that she'll be able to jump on and talk briefly about how that has gone and their successes. Nora? Hey, hey, Fred. Thanks for inviting me to this. I'm really excited to see all these other cooperators and I, like all of you, look nothing more than bragging about my co-op. Um, but yeah, we opened in March 2018 in Olympia, Washington. We're a home care co-op, so it's caregiver-owned. We provide in-home services to seniors and to adults um, with disabilities who would like to age in place, you know, as opposed to go to a facility. Um, and many of the barriers facing caregivers are um, incredibly, incredibly low wages and in irregular hours and, you know, really uh, poor treatment in the, in the work sector. And um, so we've really been trying to show that uh, by providing better care and paying better wages that we were better. Um, and I, I can say, you know, so I'll just say like, yeah, we're successful. We're much better than the other home care agencies. Um, in the past three years, since we opened in March, 2018, um, we've, the caregivers have voted on being able to give themselves about $3 in raises in that time. Um, we've uh, been more than profitable in these three years. Uh, just like when COVID hit for, for everybody, we took a really big hit. We got hit about, we lost about 70% of our business last year in about a week, um, which was really scary. Uh, and I would say that it's because of our cooperative approach that um, we were so successful. You know, our caregivers really, like everyone stuck around and made sure that we got through. So we broke even, we're profitable again. Um, 
And we're really just excited to, you know, we're looking at um, expanding into a public pay option. Um, you know, we're trying to create the jobs that, that we dreamed of, you know, a few years ago. And so it was with the direct support of the Northwest Cooperative Development Center and people like John McNamara and Deborah Craig and Fred Medlicott and the whole crew that this was able to happen. And I will brag about it anytime. Thanks, Mara. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, and if you don't mind, we'll have you stick around just in case folks have questions for you later. But if you need to go, I know you're super busy too, so that's okay. And then I wanted to talk a little bit, are, are people hearing me? And Nora's frozen. Can anyone, can you hear me? Am I frozen? Yeah. Okay, you can hear me, great. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that I mostly do here at Northwest Cooperative Development Center. I'm involved with a little bit of worker co-op organizing and development, um, but my main area that I work in is actually in the housing cooperatives and specifically here in Washington, the uh, resident owned community program, which is where we help residents of mobile and manufactured home parks um, purchase the property that they live on and then manage them as cooperatives. Um, and so mobile and manufactured housing parks are um, one of the most affordable housing options that tend to exist in a given community. Um, and they're, they're under danger uh, both of development and they're just being purchased up by uh, private equity firms and investors um, tend to be highly extractive. So, you know, the, the money that people are paying for their lot fees for the the, home, the land that their home's under um, is not necessarily going back into improvements for the community. It's, it's mostly going to the owner. Um, and so when they convert to cooperatives, they, they one, they secure the land under their homes. So there's no danger that it's going to be developed, that they'll be made to move the homes. And often, despite the fact that they're called mobile homes, they're not actually mobile. Um, so so it's, a, it's a real danger if, if the, the land gets purchased and, and either redeveloped that folks can, can outright lose their homes. So once it's a co-op, that, that housing is secured and it helps them stabilize their rents. So they only need to raise their rents if they need to raise their rents, right? It's a co-op. They're not trying to make a profit. They're just trying to provide themselves with stable, affordable housing. Um, and it's it's interesting work doing it because it's not folks where as at the, uh, you know, you typically in a worker co-op situation, you've got a group of folks from a, a similar, you know, background, at least as far as work. And, and they've all sort of made the conscious decision to, to start a worker cooperative. Um, in the work that I do, it's it's, it's more along the lines of, you know, I kind of show up and tell folks, hey, uh, you're the owner of this place is going to sell it. Do you want to buy it? And if you do, um, we're going to rush through a 60-day process to make that happen. So my job is to kind of help people steward steward them through that process, make sure it's the right decision for that community, um, that they actually want to do it. And then after that, we continue to provide technical assistance um, for the next at least 10 years to help them manage those uh, communities and so even in the time of COVID, we've we've done a couple different we've done a couple conversions last year, and I think we've got potentially three more and maybe even five going on now. Um, if they all happen, that'll be twenty mobile and manufactured home communities in the state that will have converted. I think maybe Victoria can correct me if I've got my math wrong. Um, and oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's it's several hundred affordable housing home sites that we've managed to preserve. But the, the big thing is similar to people participating in the worker cooperation or the worker cooperatives. You see folks go from feeling like, you know, they, they don't know how to run a business. They've got no idea if they can be on the board to, uh, to you know, people get really empowered. They learn a lot or they realize how much they already knew is, is more common. Um, and, and folks that get involved with the governance and the, and the management in those communities um, also end up sort of using their voice a lot more than they than they were in the past so it's, it can be really rewarding for me um and specifically we've got communities that have converted recently in roy washington um just outside of yelm we've got another one down in centralia that was a retirement community that converted last year um, and then several more around the state and, and several on the east side too. So yeah, I just wanted to call out that work. It's, it's been going really well so far. Like I said, we're, we're almost up to 20 communities and we do more every year. Um, so that's great because it's, it's a really good way to secure affordable housing. And that's another thing that we've been working on at the, both the state and the local level is uh, both opportunity to purchase or uh, first right of refusal legislation and um, support for, for preservation of those mobile and manufactured housing communities through uh, through cooperative ownership. Um, 
making kind of the, the economic argument to to city and state officials that it's it's just a makes dollars and cents sense to to convert them um but it's also you know great for the folks who live in them and then john is going to talk a little bit more about our um work doing worker cooperative conversions and then we'll we'll open it up to questions yeah so i uh i just want to point out two conversions to give an example of how these conversions can really make the difference in the community. So the first, uh, the both of them are in Olympia, Washington, where we're based. Uh, the first one is a software company. So it's a software company that actually writes software for labor unions called Working Systems. And um, the owners were ready to retire. In fact, they were kind of beyond ready to retire a couple of years ago. And they contacted us because no one in, on the staff really was that interested in being the owner. And one of the more senior uh, uh, workers there said to me, you know, I could buy it, but I want to retire in, in five or six years, and I don't want to have to go through trying to sell it, because who knows what that's going to be like. And, uh, and the reality is, for that business, if they had sold to their competitor, chances are the competitor wouldn't need the coders, they would just need the contracts, right? And so those jobs would just be lost, you know, decent union jobs lost to, uh, to Olympia and to those families, right? They would have to choose either to relocate if they even got the opportunity, or, uh, or or they would just have to find a different job. Of course, you know, the software industry is what it is. Um, so, uh, so that's one example where 16 jobs were saved through conversion. And actually, since then, within the first year, they actually expanded to 20 people. They're doing really well. They're, um, you know, one of the things we see in cooperatives and conversions is productivity tends to really pop up once uh, people become owners, uh, because suddenly it is their business and it's. Uh, and they, they really care more about it. They're a really incredible group of people. Uh, but that's you know one example of, of where conversions and why cities should be thinking about conversions is really important. The other is one that probably might surprise some people, but it's a bookstore. So Orca Books in uh, Olympia, they sell mostly used, but also new books. Uh, they've been around for 26 years or so. Bookstores, as you might guess, have not had a good time of it in the last 20 years. Uh, but you know, slowly they've been making a comeback, and a couple. And basically, uh, last year, uh, Orca was at the point where they had to do something, and it was either going to be become a cooperative or close. And and they chose to become a cooperative, but they chose to become what's called a solidarity cooperative. So their consumer members and their staff members, there are about seven, eight staff members, and I think there's about 700 community members. So this is what's exciting about it is that. 700 people in the community care enough about this bookstore and what it meant to being in downtown Olympia as a cultural touchstone for the city that they ponied up and raised about $75,000 in equity to cover the cost of conversion, also moving the store to a smaller location. And, um, and last December, during, you know, during the pandemic, it's one of the worst parts of the pandemic when stores were closed during the holiday season, which is also, you know, for retail, the most important time of the year, they actually outperformed their 2019 pre-pandemic numbers for sales because they had this incredible base of consumer members and worker members that made the store happen and kind of wanted to keep it alive. And so today, they're they're actually in a state of, of flourishing for a bookstore in a, in a community that actually already has, you know, two other independent bookstores within like half a mile of their store, plus you know, the box ship, box stores and Amazon to boot. So I think those are just a couple of examples of what it can mean for a city and a downtown core to be able to have some plan of, of, of conversion. We're working and talking with the city of Olympia. There are people, you know, on, on the city's uh, staff that are really excited about, you know, Olympia has like 10 or 11 worker co-ops for a community of 50,000. And so we really feel like there's a moment here and, um, and so it's it's going to be exciting to see again how we can take these success stories and move them forward to uh, to create policy. And then just as a last pitch, I want to mention that before we get to questions, we do an annual academy, and we are doing our academy this summer. It'll be online. I'll put a link in the chat. But uh, for anyone thinking about doing co-ops, it's a great opportunity to come in and and get some direct uh, technical assistance from us, no matter where you are. I'll get back to you for a while. 
Thanks, John. Yeah, and the idea, um, just to give a little bit more information, the idea about the the academy is it's a several weeks long, um, you know, sessions in the evening typically, and the idea is that to take people from sort of the ideation stage to uh, ready to actually start their, uh, you know, at least start the process of starting their cooperative at the end of it. So, so it's if you if you've got your idea but you don't have any idea where to start, the academy is a great place. Um, okay, now I think we are ready to just open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I don't know, John, or do people have the ability to unmute themselves, or should we should we limit it to chat? If uh, if folks have questions, they want to type them in the chat, and I can just read them. I think people can unmute if they want to. Or they can do it in the chat either way. Let's see. Do we have any questions for, for either John or I or any of our uh, guest speakers? I'm looking through the chat to see if we had any during the. Owen's raising his hand. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Owen, go for it. Thanks. Hi. Uh, um... You know, I've got so many questions. Uh, uh, so I'm uh, here in Port Townsend, a uh, city of under 10,000, board president of the food co-op. Um, and uh, so all of these tales of worker co-ops are fascinating and, and, and really exciting. Uh, you know, my, my day job is at an arts nonprofit, so I, I don't get that experience. Um, and uh, so board president is one of my uh, side jobs and uh, one of my other side jobs, uh, uh, Rebecca uh, uh, can identify with this, I'm on city council. Um, and so I'm surrounded by opportunities for, you know, moving forward, but I don't really have the resources myself to devote the time to this. And, uh, you know, lots of uh, ideas about uh, working with economic development, working with the city government, uh, you know, we have uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we brought John and the NWCDC team in, uh, and we had a, a co-op academy in our county, you know, county population is only 30,000, uh, but we, you know, got some uh, uh, co-op conversions and some, some, some developments from that. So there's momentum there. And I would just like to do so much more. Uh, and in particular, so I guess this is a question for Joel. And uh, Joel, um, my previous day job was working with Laura Lewis and Abba Kaiser and Nicole Witham at uh, WSU Food Systems. So I, I had no idea you were going to be here, but the, the, the Worker Co-op Holding Company, tell us more. That's my question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um... Not sure exactly where to go. Let's see, I guess I could say that um, uh, it's just a really exciting model to me. Um, one of the interesting benefits that we've already discovered in these early kind of formative uh, conversations with uh, potential businesses, potential workers, and potential investors is that it's a really interesting model to um, diversify risk both for worker owners and for investors. So I can talk about that a bit. So if you're an investor, um, knowing this from starting two previous independent uh, worker and farmer owned cooperatives, it's still hard to raise capital. Um, you're still small, you're still new, you're untested, untried. Um, and there are certainly ways to do it. We've followed the equal exchange model of offering um, class B preferred stock um, that pays a 5% annual dividend um, and got a lot of support from them and kind of um, adapting that model to our own use um, along with, you know, debt and other instruments. Um, but still it's difficult. It's, it's hard to, to help investors who care about the local community kind of release their capital from Wall Street and that casino and put it into something that's actually beneficial and tangible to their own community. And with the holding cooperative model, because we'll come to essentially be like a fund almost, we're going to be a worker owned fund of small businesses. Well, you know, I mean, the, the vision is quite large and 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 small business entities, you know, hopefully thousands of worker owners down the road. Um, investing in us is, uh, 
is a much safer bet than investing in any one particular small business. So I think we're going to be able to harness a lot more um, capital from the local community, from people who care about developing uh, our community, our city, and help building worker power, democratizing wealth and ownership. Um, it's just, a, it's a, even early, we, we've done nothing, you know, substantive yet, and and people are excited about it. I think it just makes a lot of sense. It's it's going to be a great investment. From the worker side, it's also really exciting. So uh, even challenges that both of us have as independent, um, uh, both of our co-ops have as independent small businesses with, you know, 10 to 15 uh, worker owners or employees at any given time. Um, think about it this way. If you're in this ecosystem, this holding cooperative that we're building, you might hold one role for 10 hours a week at one of the entities. You might hold another role for 20 hours a week at one of the other entities. You might hold another role for 10 hours a week at one of the other entities. You still only have one employer, the holding cooperative but you might perform three different roles at three different workplaces that really best utilize your skills. And those entities, if they were independent, would probably never be able to access your skills. You know, they might hire for a 10 hour a week person. That's not interesting to you. Now you have a way to contribute your skills to multiple businesses in, a, in an entire ecosystem, but only have one employer at the end of the day that you also co-own. Um, so that's really interesting. And also it is a way not only to unlock talent in that way, um, and to create like a really interesting employment pool that's more fluid between multiple small businesses, but it's a hedging on a risk for you as well, you know, long term jobs right if one of our 50 small businesses fails or has to be wound down. So be it right like we can, in theory, just like with Mondragon kind of find a new place for a lot of those people find a way to utilize those same skills from within that network and that's why we really do want to focus on on building a, a diverse group of businesses in different industry areas so that uh, we can really utilize that piece. So I'm sure there's more to say, but those, those are some of the early uh, pieces of excitement that we're finding um, uh, on both sides of the equation. Thanks, Joel. Is there a place where people can follow that project yet? Very soon, very, very soon. Okay. Um, we got, we're going to have the domain spokane.coop. Be pretty easy to find. Um, and uh, that is not live yet, but uh, hopefully within the next month, it will be. Watch your inbox for uh, invites from about 20 people to <laughs> <laughs> come and talk about it. Thank you. The, uh, yeah, and I'm glad you uh, you mentioned the connection there between uh, that project and, and Mondragon. I think it's worth calling out that sort of everywhere around the world where there, there are uh, really robust um, social and solidarity economies, it's the result of this kind of activity where the, the social enterprises or the, uh, the solidarity economy enterprises are networking and uh, building, you know, what we call cooperative capital that they can use to, uh, you know, develop more co-ops and, and support each other and absorb some of that risk. So that's really exciting. Thank you. Uh, I think Chris did ask question, Chris. We can't hear you. broke up a little bit. Fred, you're breaking up. He was inviting Chris who has yeah, their hand up and yeah, thank you. Hey, while we're waiting for Chris Tiger, did you want to? Uh... Sure, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, I'm actually here technically uh, in the capacity of a, of a, of a worker at a, at a for-profit business that's considering a transition. But, um, and John and I are in correspondence about that, but uh, there are a lot of layers to this thing. Um, I'm also on the steering committee for the Olympic Cooperative Network, um, which is really just a, um, a mesh, you know, a, a, a place where, where people are encouraged to get together. Um, but I noticed, you know, this talk of city council, I'm, I'm gonna run for city council this year and hoping to sit next to Owen in my little town um, which would theoretically put two on a council with um, with prospects to make moves like we're talking about here. So I, my my basic question, um, and I'll give a little background here because I, I'm sitting down often uh, every other week right now and and corresponding a bunch with a pool of seven other potential candidates for this city council race in our little town. 
um, which is a lot, you know, in three, with three seats open and already uh, one other sitting council member in, in this room, literally, uh, there's a lot of options there. So I want to start planting seeds. And I'm wondering if I can just get um, some model, you know, some, some links to models. Um, I think this question goes to Zen maybe or whoever, but I'd love to just get, um, you know, some snapshots of the, of the various models are out there for, for Durham or New York City, um, because I'd like to actually bring these to the table and start planting seeds in the heads of um, ideally all of the people who would potentially be sitting next to Owen uh, in this next election cycle. Um, and uh, I have tons of questions too, but that, that was what I really, um, what I'm really eager to, to delve into right now. Great. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Just the, the short answer, most definitely. Like we, we got a bunch of stuff we could share with you. It, uh, but with everything, right, it's, uh, it might be pretty bespoke to the cities that are doing the work. And the question is how to adapt uh, to particularly for the, the size of the city, the capacity of the city, potentially how the city does small business or economic de development support in relationship to what the county does. Um, so for all that in mind, happy to not just uh, provide some, uh, some resources, but also um, be a sounding board or even to connect to some other folks that we're working with um, across the country um, that might be willing to speak with y'all as well. Um, I, we're releasing a report with the National League of Cities um, in about a couple of weeks, actually, that basically just describes everything we're talking about today, which is why cities should invest in employee ownership as part of their equitable economic recovery agendas. And what does it take to do it? Um, what are some examples of cities doing it? Um, what are the, you know, the, the, the ideas that we think will have the most traction um, for both startup support, but mostly around conversions to employee ownership. So that's coming out soon. That's something I can, I can send off. Um, so I'd be happy to put my email in the chat box to um, pass that along once we have it. We also um, are convening a number of cities um, as part of this kind of uh, evolution of the program I mentioned earlier. We're calling it employee ownership cities. And the idea behind it is let's, let's make employee ownership something that is like climate change in terms of a commitment to do something about economic inequity, to do something about community wealth building in our communities and say, hey, look, you know, city of Durham's doing something, city of Port Townsend is doing something, right? Spokane's doing something. Let's learn from each other. Let's figure out what are the ways in which we're making employee ownership work? Um, uh, where are some of the challenges that we're facing? What are some of the ways we're using federal funding or sometimes state funding that comes from federal sources to be able to make this work? Um, so that we can accelerate the, the learning process, right? A little bit of cross-pollination. So, We've, we're, we're building that out this year and I'll share more on that. In the meantime, we're holding what's called shared equity webinar series, webinars. Didn't really think through the webinar or webinar title, but so for short, it builds on our seed idea. Anyways, it's kind of corny. But the idea is we have these quarterly calls where cities can learn about all the, all the creative ways that we're driving. The folks in the field are driving innovation toward you know, employee ownership to get at this like a question of capital get at the question of um, how do you support people with barriers to employment to begin with, be able to access these opportunities. So um, uh, that's all resources I can share and um, be able to um, connect you to, to the folks that we're also working with in the other cities doing something around employee ownership. Thank you, Zan. And then uh, Chris, is your, is your mic working? I hope so. Am I there we go. Here? Yeah, yep. Sorry about that. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone who's presented, Zen, Kirk, Rebecca, Joel, um, Nora, wish we could have heard more from Nora, but like just an amazing wealth of really inspirational information. And, um, you know, I really mean that from the bottom of my heart, like nothing helps me get out of bed more in the morning than thinking about, um, you know, these, these very real and very concrete pathways to addressing inequity and addressing all these massive issues. So I really appreciate it. Um, I've talked with David, or I mean, I'm sorry, with John McNamara, and I hope I'm saying that right. John, was that close? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll work it out. Um, we'll, I'm sure I'm gonna be speaking more with him. Um, I, yeah, it's hard for me to know what to ask. I'm an owner of a sole proprietorship, very small company that, um, I want to turn into a cooperative and that was kind of the dream from the start but i started it like without a lot of resources or you know a lot of capital without a lot of it, you know it's just a very small deal so i started it as a sole proprietorship and i am 
um, working the transition towards a co-op, co already identified um, one worker owner who is like one of the subscribers to my internet service. That's that's what the company is. It's an internet service provider. Um, it was really cool to see. I didn't write down who mentioned it, but working systems in um, Olympia, like that there's another tech cooperative out there because it's just so, you know, it's so rare to see a tech company be a cooperative and there's no reason for that. It's, it's just like the culture of tech, I guess, is not, not about it, but um, so I don't know, I do want to put my email out in the chat and anyone particularly like in Bellingham or in the Bellingham area who would like to network and uh, we could support each other. Yeah, more and more all the time. That's great. One more soon by the end of the, I'm hoping by the end of Q2. Um, there are so many questions, but um, yeah, has anyone heard of that story where transitioning from a sole proprietorship? Um, Zen Zen's nodding his head, or and not even, yeah. Obviously, sole proprietorships have been done. I guess for me, it's like very small. Um, some of the questions I have are like, how do I, uh, like, what is the fair balance to strike between like um, respecting the investment of time and energy and capital that I've put in so far, and also like, but without, you know diminishing what new people are bringing to the table. I um, also have questions about like how specific the bylaws and all these documents need to be from the jump. Um, in my mind, it and this is the same logic that got me in the sole proprietorship, but in my mind, it's better to uh, move fast and break things and just start small with like the minimum viable product when it comes to bylaws and such. Um, I guess those are two questions on my mind. How do you respect those initial founders without disrespecting the like tier two founders and um, how how small is too small for the bylaws um, in your starting stage? Um, I think John could probably field that question, but I'm a little curious if Kirk, do you, since, since you've relatively recently gone through that process of transitioning from, you know, founding owner to uh, to worker member, do you want to talk about how you navigated that? Sure, I can go after John or whatever. No, go first. John can wait. Oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I would say, so I, I'm a big fan of plan your plan your war out. So when it comes, it comes time to fight it, it's easy. You already know what you're doing. Everybody knows their position. Everybody knows what they're doing. Invest the time and money in creating documents that really represent what you're trying to accomplish. Like what we did is we took, we had six people of our, in, in our development team, my wife and I and four other workers in our group. And we created a, a team that went through this process of conversion, but we were very deliberate in what we wanted to see. And we, we, we had a decision matrix, who makes decisions and what, what are the criteria for those decisions. Um, you set thresholds. You basically create the constitution of your business and, and your charter of your business. So I, I, I compare this to city hall um, or city government where the members are the, are the constituents, the, the residents. Um, the council would be the board that you elect as, as the residents or the members. And then the city manager would be like the general manager on the side that's hired by the board or the council. And, and they all work together and that board represents the interest. But in order for them to represent the interest, they don't know what they're trying to represent and what, what you're trying to accomplish. And so this is really, really important to be as crystal clear and crystallize your vision and your message of what you're trying to do, not in legal, not in legalese, just in what you're trying to do as a, as a group and what, what your goals are, what your priorities are, um, and what consequences, if any, if you want to do some of that stuff. And then when you're done with that, you agree on that. Then you give it to the lawyers, let them turn into a legal document. You know, who cares about that? that that's the easy stuff as far as I'm You just pay for that. I mean, it costs money, but you, you, someone can do that. You don't have to worry about that. Worry about the content and what you're trying to do. And then, because once, once that's baked in, every member signs off on it. Changing your bylaws is difficult. I mean, it, it should be. 
and it requires, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's a supermajority in our case, I think it's a supermajority, or it's consensus minus one. Some people make it consensus based, so you can't change the bylaws unless everybody agrees that's a member. And so they should be very hard to change. So you should make sure they are rock solid when you start. Don't just say I have a one page bylaws just to start the company and I'll figure it out later. I think that's a, that's a mistake. I'm not saying you can't do it. Um, but I would not design build your bylaws. Design build some other stuff, but don't. I, I, that was just, that's just my opinion. <laughs> Those are thanks, Kurt. Right. John, did you have anything to add on? And then I also want to say before you go or before you start um, that I'd really like to, before we wrap up, um, see if there are anybody from either the Olympic Network or the Cascade Network that wants to talk briefly. It seems like there's some some chatter in the chat around that. So I uh, just want to say that the smallest conversion we've done is three people. Um, Washington law is relatively liberal compared to a lot of state co-op laws. So basically speaking, you can kind of start a co-op with one person. I don't really recommend that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's probably co-op kind of suggests you should have at least more than one. I think, uh, you know, but, but you know, it can be done, um, but again, it's it's getting it planned out, like Kurt said, and and um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that it's it's not terribly uncommon for for folks to to you know start a business on their own or, or or a very small just one or two people you know with with an eye towards eventually converting. Um, so it's it's definitely you're you're not the first person to to have done it, and there's there's definitely models and stuff and and working with. Uh, somebody who can provide technical assistance or just, you know, a, a worker cooperator with, with their own experience of going through the process will definitely be able to help you. I'm, I'm wondering, yeah, is there anybody from either Cascade or Peninsula that wants to talk briefly about uh, the, the work that those networks have been doing before we wrap up? I, I could talk about the uh, Olympic cooperative network. Uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, uh, well, so there, there's actually several members of our steering committee on this call, uh, and uh, we've been doing, uh, you know, mostly informal. Uh, you know, we haven't organized as uh, any kind of official organization. We just meet and talk. Uh, so the Olympic Peninsula, uh, uh, you know, we cover uh, Jefferson, Clallam, and Kitsap counties in Washington State, uh, and um, there are you know, as, as I said before, uh, a, a number of startup cooperatives. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we have any uh, ROCs going in our area yet, but uh, worker co-ops, uh, consumer co-ops, producer co-ops. Uh, and we're, we, so far, we've really mostly been kind of uh, skills exchange networking uh, uh, organization. Uh, and, you know, little bit in hibernation with COVID that we're starting to come out of and uh, uh, trying to figure out what what's the next step and how we might grow. Thanks, Owen. And do we have anybody from, from Cascade? I, I've been to a few of their- Hi. Oh, great. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Hi. I'm here. I am um, sorry. I don't have my video going for a good reason. <laughs> And um, <laughs> I have to work a, a late overnight shift tonight. And so I'm not even like functional yet entirely. Um, so Cascade Cooperatives, you know, it's really just uh, four of us that four or five of us who are kind of holding down the fort. We're just, you know, like taking baby steps and trying to gauge what we can get going on for our community up here in Bellingham and Skagit and, you know, kind of the Northwest corner. Um, we try to, we have hosted something in co-op month every year. And um, they, we hosted last year, uh, well, I guess in 2020, we hosted a, um, a webinar because of COVID that was pretty well attended and successful and, um, just talking about uh, the things we've been talking about today about how uh, 
communities in Berkeley and Madison have been supporting, getting support from their local governments because we're interested in uh, getting some support from our local government <laughs> and how we get the ball rolling on advocacy. Like, how do we even get it? How do we get some traction? And our county, um, our county uh, representative was, uh, our county executive was at that October webinar and, and seemed pretty receptive, but then kind of everything sort of fell apart during COVID days. Um, and we've also hosted um, some, some uh, workshops about uh, transferring to, from sole proprietorship to cooperative ownership that we've had some interest in and we ran kind of a co-ops 101 sort of session that was super popular. That was several years ago. So at this point, we're just trying to um, figure out how to kind of keep the momentum going and uh, get some energy from new folks. We all feel like we're all working full-time jobs and also trying to grow the network and um, and yeah, we're just doing the best we can. And I was going to put our website address in the chat, but embarrassingly, it looks like our domain expired. <laughs> so I guess that's next on our list, just to get our website going again. <laughs> I, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> Gosh. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I think it's been that kind of year for everybody. Um, and I think it's probably, we'll, we'll wrap up here just to add the, in the interest of respecting folks' time, but I, I want to remind, uh, or just uh, circle back to the CoSound project and this idea of creating the statewide network. One of the, the main goals there, once we get up and running, is going to be to, to coordinate with, uh, with the existing smaller, lo more local networks and hopefully get more started, specifically to be doing that work of trying to, um, you know, get you good sort of model uh, advocacy proposals and legislation and, and work with you to kind of do that advocacy locally and hopefully support it at the state level. So, so hopefully you folks that have been um, kind of nose to the grindstone in your local area building these networks are going to have more support here in, in a year or so once, once CoSound's up and running. So that, that is coming. Yeah, and then I think if, if, um, if we could maybe have time for one more question, but otherwise I think we are going to wrap up. I want to say thanks everybody for coming. Big, big thanks to our speakers for taking the time and sharing their experience. And uh, thanks to John for making sure that this actually happened. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Um, oh yeah, I should say that good, good thinking, John. That Give Big Washington link again, that's, uh, that's if you'd like to donate to support the work that NWCDC does here in Washington. Washington um, specifically, uh, and also please feel free to share that link around um, as much as you like, because we could always use it. So yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs>